I am not going anywhere. That's the message President Biden is defiantly telling Americans as he vows not to drop out of the 2024 presidential race. This week, the president sent a letter to House Democrats urging lawmakers to back him in the election and also made an unexpected phone call into MSNBC's Morning Joe, daring other Democrats to run against him at the convention. The president continues to face pressure from lawmakers inside of his party to step aside, but Biden has made it clear, saying he won't back down. With a growing number of lawmakers inside the party turning on the president and Americans questioning his ability to lead after a disastrous debate performance, could there be a new presidential frontrunner going up against Trump this November? It's time to go on the record with Scott Tranter, director of data science from Decision Desk HQ. Scott, as always, thank you for joining me. The president hit out this week against what he called big names and elites in the Democratic Party who are calling for him to step aside. Who is he specifically referencing? And aren't those the, aren't they the same people who essentially pushed for him to be the nominee in 2020? Yeah, and the same people who pretty much cleared the field of Dean Phillips and all the rest in, in this cycle. I mean, look, the, if you're on Twitter and you're watching a lot of cable news, you're seeing a lot of people, uh, Democratic pundits and commentators talking about how he should step down. You know, we're we're a couple weeks from the from the debate and we're, we're seeing polling among Democratic voters, independent voters, both nationally in the states that also agree with some of those political elites and pundits. Biden seems to be taking advice from a very small inner circle, which includes his sister Valerie Biden and his wife Jill Biden. They've told the president to hold on, to hold more un unscripted events and appearances. The president has held rallies in North Carolina, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. What has his message been to voters who are worrying about his mental acuity? His, you know, his message has been right. Like I had a bad night. I'm fine. I beat him once before I can beat him again. You know, those are good messages. Those are, you know, I shouldn't say good. Those are the messages he's going with. Again, when we look at the polling and we look at what the, the pundits and commentators think, um, you know, they're not necessarily uh, convinced that that is the right winning message. You know, I thought we were transported back to 2016 this week because uh, President Biden called into MSNBC's Morning Joe. I say this because President Trump used to call into a number of a weekday morning political talk shows, so it felt familiar. But, you know, during that surprise call in, the president essentially threatened fellow Democrats to run against him or dared them to run against him. Is there any chance anyone will actually take him up on that? And theoretically, what would they need to do to replace Biden at the Democratic National Convention next month? It seems to be a pretty complicated process. Yeah, complicated. Look, and this is this is the political roller coaster. If we were talking a few days ago, I thought it was 50-50 that uh, Biden would be replaced as the nominee. You know, as of a few hours ago, you know, on Tuesday, Wednesday, we've got some of these Democratic caucus meetings coming up. It seems like, um, you know, he solidified his position after that morning Joe appearance and a, and a strong letter to Congress. Who knows? He may have a press conference later this week and slip and fall or have a have a have a uh, have a have a, uh, a mental breakdown or something like that. Something something to bring the news back up. This 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 could all go back and forth. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the only person who can re really remove himself at the uh, as the nominee is Joe Biden. He's going to have to tell his delegates to vote for someone else. Um, you know, the way the DNC and the mechanics work, those those delegates, he, he won uh, fair square in the primary. And, you know, on the first ballot, they're 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 going to vote for him. And so if he wants to uh, if, if the Dems want a new nominee, they're going to have to convince Joe Biden to uh, repledge his delegates um, and open that up, which most likely would go to, to VP Kamala Harris if it happens. Yeah, um, before that meeting with House Democrats today, Congressman Jerry Nadler um, notably reversed his position. He had initially called on the president to drop out of the ticket, drop off the ticket, and now he's saying the president is going to be a nominee. So definitely a bit of a vibe shift up on Capitol Hill. So Scott Politico reported this week that the president said he is done talking about that presidential debate during a phone call with his National Finance Committee. Will he be able to move forward and quell discussions on the debate and what would the impact be if donors stopped financing his 2024 campaign? I mean, look, um, this is going, Biden's going to be asked about this up until election day. And if he wins, uh, you know, into his administration, um, you know, what's the impact of this? 
Yeah, no, look, I I mean, he can say he doesn't want to talk about the debate, but, you know, it's the, the, the right of the free press and American voters to question whatever they want. Um, and they, they've kind of formed an opinion on it. And I don't necessarily know that that, you know, the news cycles after the debate is so great for him. We're talking about how many doctor visits he had from a but potentially a, a Parkinson specialist that's still kind of out there and floating around, you know, they're going to start talking about why is he not doing more events or why is he not taking questions? I don't think the post debate um, questioning or, you know, derivatives of the post debate question are going to go away. And then about two months from now, we're going to have another debate. So th- this is not something he's going to be able to get away, w- get away from talking about. Um, and conversely, as you mentioned with the donors, the donors have questions about it, right? Like donors are, are, are transactional. They're going to give money because they, 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 they're getting something, you know, they're getting some, some messaging and hope and, and chance of winning from the candidate. And so they're going to ask him that question. And, and I'm reading the same thing you are. The donors are, are worried uh, about investing, uh, in this presidential campaign. And some of them are saying, Hey, we're going to withhold our support, um, until there's a new nominee. Now we haven't seen a groundswell of that, but that could certainly change, um, you know, depending on how, uh, Uh, President Biden campaigns over the next couple months. Yeah, Abigail Disney, one of those donors who has said she will withhold funds uh, to Biden and the Democrats unless they pick a new nominee. That's a major name and one to watch. So as Democrats continue to discuss potential alternatives to Biden, well, like we've said, he he has said he is not dropping out. Is there any new polling showing that someone else could beat Trump? I understand there was some polling last week that showed Kamala Harris was polling a little better than expected against Trump, but he was still beating her. Yeah, look, it, there's not a lot of polling, head to head polling in Kamala Harris versus Donald Trump and even less in, you know, individual battleground states when it matters. Um, and that's probably because she's not the the top of the ticket. There's not a lot of reason to do a lot of polling on her. So if if we, she were to swap out in the first couple of weeks, I think the, the initial polling everyone would look at would be her behind. Now, she would have the advantage of a full war chest and the ability to campaign and and not have to answer about a debate or, or, or her health. So she would have an opportunity to move those numbers up. But certainly right out of the gate, she would not she would not be starting in a better position uh, or a much better position, if that, than, than uh, Joe Biden is right now, which is behind Donald Trump. Biden has struggled to appeal to progressives in his party. Um, you know, what are progressives saying about his debate performance and the concerns over his age? I understand that Pramila Jayapal and um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez have come out in support of Biden. That's certainly good news for him, right? Yeah, you saw that AOC statement. Where, did you have to read it twice to make sure it wasn't fake? Um, yeah. You know, this is the same AOC who a couple of years ago said, hey, I, if we, you know, we were in Europe, I wouldn't even be in the same party as Joe Biden. This is the same AOC who, you know, spent the last four or five months going right on the edge and maybe a little bit over it, heavily criticizing the president on his his stance in, in Israel. So that statement was 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 very helpful to him because the, everyone was looking at the squad and those progressives is the one to lead the charge for a replacement especially for uh, for VP Harris. So that was a that was a good shore up for him this week. But we'll see if it holds. I mean, it's just as quickly as as these members of Congress and the Senate have an opinion there. They they are looking at their own seats and their own majorities. Um, and, you know, everyone, all of them are, are looking out for their own self-interest there. You know, Scott, President Trump or former President Trump has been doing something a little different. He's been staying more quiet than usual. Uh, He gave an interview to Fox News' Sean Hannity um, on Monday night and talked a little bit about what he thinks is going to happen. But in general, he and his campaign have been quite disciplined with their messaging. What is the impact of that? The impact is, is he's letting Joe Biden's campaign have to deal and the presidency have to deal with the aftermath of the debate. You know, Donald Trump was for the last 10 years or so has been very, very good at owning the political news cycle um, and moving from one news cycle to another. This level of discipline we've seen for the last two weeks is not something I've ever seen before. I'm quite surprised he's able to do it. I imagine, you know, next week when we get to the RNC convention and there's a there's a VP nomination on his side, he's probably going to retake it a little bit. But this level of discipline in this campaign is certainly not something we saw in his 2016 campaign or his 2020 campaign. So sticking with Republicans, this week the Republican National Committee panel passed a draft party platform that greatly shifted the GOP's stance on abortion, aligning more closely with President Trump's messaging on the issue. Will we see Republicans line up behind this new platform, or is this you know, just a push for the presidential race? I thought it was interesting that former Vice President Mike Pence pushed back a bit on this. 
Yeah, look, hey, look, the, the party platform votes both for the DNC and RNC are largely very insider affairs. And it's a document that most people don't read, a couple news stories on it, those types of things. So, you know, on one hand, it is, as you point out, it is a political angle that they are softening up because they want everything, um, you know, everything they can to soften up for 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 the middle. But on the other hand, you know, a few a few hundred delegates, a few thousand delegates are going to approve it next week um, at the larger convention. And then the document, you know, everyone's going to forget what drawer they put it in. Um, so on one hand, it's it matters for this week's news story, but I don't know necessarily that it's going to matter a few months from now, other than the Trump campaign has removed some of those more contentious um, uh, party platforms around abortion and women's reproductive rights that they don't necessarily want to have to answer questions on. They can just say, look, we softened it up. That's our stance now. So speaking of the RNC, Scott, in just a few days, the Republican National Convention will kick off in Milwaukee. Trump has previously said he will announce his VP pick during the convention. What else can we expect to see come out of the convention? Uh, you know what? Probably the VP pick is the only thing that anyone um, is really going to care about. I guess, you know, everyone's surprised to learn it's like four nights of events, um, all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I think that'll be the biggest thing. There will be some speeches by some people up on stage in prime time that are going to make some waves that we are going to be talking about there because this is this is the this is the place where the next 2028 candidates, the next uh, want to be governors, senators, congressmen, congresswomen want to make a speech so they can you know make their mark in front of the the core Republican audience here. So I would imagine that we're going to see some some uh, uh, how do I put it some 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 flashy speeches that are that we're going to want to talk about. But other than the VP pick, that's pretty much it coming out next week, and that's all they want. They want it focused on the VP pick and how they're going to win in November. Scott Franter, as always, yeah. thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Concerns surrounding President Biden's age and ability to serve were swirling long before the first presidential debate. And Biden did very little to quell those fears when he stepped onto the debate stage. It's time to wake up, Washington. Making sure that we're able to make every single solitary person uh, eligible for what I've been able to do with the uh, with, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look. President Biden appeared to freeze at one point, rambled and struggled with his train of thought, unleashing a firestorm of calls for him to drop out of the presidential race. He just has to step down because uh, he can't win. We should be seeking a stronger alternative than we have from President Biden. But the president remained defiant and insisted this is not about age. It's about getting the job done, a job he insists he can do. I know I'm not a young man. <laughs> State the obvious. I don't walk as easy as I used to. I don't speak as smoothly as I used to. I don't deba debate as well as I used to. But I know what I do know. I know how to tell the truth. Despite Biden's assurance he is fit to run the country, a new CBS YouGov poll following the debate shows 86% of registered voters say Biden shouldn't be running for president due to his age. Joining us now is geriatrician, professor of medicine, and one of America's leading aging experts, Dr. Luis Aronson. Luis, thank you so much for joining us. You know, just to jump right into it, Fears over President Biden's age and mental acuity have been really running rampant in the week or week and a half since the debate, even with his, within his own party. Have you seen anything in his behavior that would be of concern to you as a medical doctor? Um, I think it's a great question. And that what's going on is probably a blend of ageism, ableism and legitimate concerns. Uh, I can't make a diagnosis either ethically or legally of someone uh, who I have not seen as a patient. Um, are there areas for concern? There are. So statistically, we know that as people enter into their 80s, um, the risk of illness, hospitalization, and death goes up. Um, in particular, some of the things that increase the risk of that are gait speed, um, a sense of how much reserve you have physically or cognitively. Um, there is some overlap here between ableism, you know, can you have some challenges and still function well in the office? Yes. But we're also looking at a four and a half year trajectory from now until the end of the next term. So I do think some of the concerns are legitimate medically. 
And it's worth to point out that his opponent, former President Trump, is only a few years younger than President Biden. So he would be in his 80s as well at the end of a term if he wins in November. So I want to move to one uh, post-debate poll that showed 72 percent of registered voters saying Biden does not have the mental and cognitive health to serve as president. Luis, does that seem like a fair assumption given the responsibility and ability to serve as president? Or is ageism permeating these these sentiments? It seems like from your, you know, it's a bit of a blend of both. Yeah, I do think it's a bit of both. And it's also about appearance. I mean, here we have a heterosexual white male Christian president, right? And people expect something. They expect a level of vigor. Um, and, and you can say, well, Trump exudes that vigor, but he has other big risk factors heading into his 80s. Uh, for Biden, I can see why people's confidence is shaken. And I do think there's a bit of a blend of ageism because when we see frailty, we have a certain response, particularly in males. I think there's a little bit of sex bias there mm. as well. Um, and, and I think there's legitimate concern. The presidency is a very important office. Now, do people have lots of people around them helping make decisions and make things happen? Yes. But what would happen if there was a sustained crisis? Um, might he have the capacity? It's very hard to say without um, seeing him in action. But one does get concerned. Anybody who's lived over age 50 knows that your fatigue factor goes up and the speed at which you respond to things tends to go down. So are we even asking the right questions when it comes to President Biden's age and mental acuity? Do you think ultimately this is about age or ability? I know that a lot of the allies of President Biden have sort of pushed back at the news media's framing of this story. Right. I think it should always be about ability for people of all ages um, and backgrounds. But, but there are ways in which we actually don't have all kinds of other, perhaps, you know, one could argue necessary requirements for the presidency. It seems that when the founding fathers set things up, they were expecting a certain kind of person only um, to be applying. Uh, there is some ableism here, I think, which is, you know, some discrimination against people with uh, certain disabilities, which can include moving more slowly or thinking more slowly. Uh, but a pushback against that, which I think is legitimate in this case, is that if a person has a disability, so there have been mm -hmm. uh, analogies to FDR, for example. Yeah. But usually with disability, we're thinking about a fixed disability. And when people are in their 80s, we expect things to get worse. And nobody wants to think about that or to live through it. Um, but it is the rare person whose health and function increases uh, despite the best efforts. So, so I think, yes, it's a blend. And because it's not fixed, this is more than just ableism. So in today's landscape, you know, an 81-year-old CEO, particularly in a publicly tra traded company, would probably, I would assume, struggle to be accepted by most large companies. Why do you think presidential candidates and politicians in general, remember there's, you know, a number of senators, for example, who have served or are serving in their 80s, why do they believe they are more capable to run a country in their 80s than the most of the public does? Uh, well, I think it takes a certain sort of person to think that you can make that big a difference and to also want that amount of attention on yourself and your life. So they may be unlike many of us. You know, I speak to all sorts of people in their 60s and 70s really looking forward to retiring. And then we have these other people who aren't. And you sort of think if your horizon is limited, again, something people don't like to think about, but a simple fact of life. Um, when older people are dying, and over the 30 years of my career, I have been with many such people, they rarely think, oh, I wish I had worked longer or taken that promotion. It's more about why didn't I spend more time with my children or grandchildren? Um, why didn't I value these other things? And somehow as a society, we have not generally, and then very specifically for politicians, um, made that an attractive alternative for people or an attractive way of spending, you know, what is uh, ultimately the, the final years or decades of life. Uh, 
maybe we retire, you know, people retire too early now and there really are decades and we need more people working. But there is also a phase in very late life um, where living in a different sort of way um, and maybe without a full time career makes sense for both the person and society. Yeah, it's an incredibly personal decision once someone gets to that point in their life. And, you know, when it's talking about ageism, obviously no form of prejudice is acceptable, but ageism does seem to be one of the last socially acceptable prejudices. Why do we see that still? Well, my thought is it's because we imprint on ourselves as young. And I rarely do I meet a person, myself included, who ages and isn't surprised to find themselves growing older. So we all have this notion of the inner self. And, and there are sort of those joke pictures where you have um, the older person looking in the mirror and seeing themselves younger, sort of akin to the kitten looking and seeing a lion. We have notions of ourselves. Ageism is also the biggest internalized prejudice. Um, so people do it to themselves in ways other prejudices are, are just not seen, um, and they do it to others. So if anybody is of an age where somebody has brought up, maybe you shouldn't be driving anymore, and they think that's ridiculous, then to say, well, the president, I don't understand why this man is running for president, we all do it to ourselves and each other. And it's something we should all work on because this is the one category the vast majority of us will eventually enter, regardless of our other background characteristics. Yeah, and I think that's what makes the situation the president is going through or you know how people are seeing the president seem so personal to so many people because they've dealt with a family member, a parent, or themselves who is going through a somewhat uh, similar situation, though being president is a bit more of a rarity in that case. Dr. Louise Aronson, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. They say with age comes wisdom, and historically, there have been no shortage of leaders serving out their golden years in office. Staff writer Rafael Bernal goes in-depth this week on some of the oldest rulers in longest terms around the world. The incumbent president is barreling toward an upcoming election despite widespread concerns about his age. Cameroon's Paul Biya, 91, is likely to run and win in the country's 2025 election. I bet you thought I meant a different president. President Biden, despite being the oldest US president in history, he doesn't even crack the top 10 in oldest serving heads of state. Well, according to the Pew Research Center, he's the ninth oldest because it all depends on who counts and who doesn't. But Bia is the undisputed leader of this pack. He's followed by Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, King Salman of Saudi Arabia, Pope Francis, and King Harold V of Norway. Now, three of those leaders have lifetime appointments, as do Iranian Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei and Kuwaiti Emir Michel I. But the top 10 is rounded out by three presidents, Michael Higgins of Ireland, Sergio Mattarella of Italy, and Nangolo Mumba of Namibia. Now, Higgins is term limited, and he's scheduled to leave office in 2025 at age 84. And Mattarella's term ends in 2029, when he'll be 87 or 88. Mumba, who's about to turn 83, took over in February after his predecessor's death, and he declined to run in Namibia's election this year. So on this side of the ocean, President Biden and former President Trump they both want to set a record as the oldest U.S. president in history. Biden broke that record the day he took office. He had just turned 78, beating former President Ronald Reagan, who left the presidency at 77. If Trump wins in November, he'll break the record near the end of his term at age 82, the age Biden is turning this November. There's no question people lose a step as they age. But there's also no denying the power of experience. And aging world leaders, even those who slow down, are sometimes able to cash in on that experience and sometimes not. Take Robert Mugabe. In 1980, he led Zimbabwe to independence, fighting off a racist apartheid regime and immediately focused the new country's efforts on health and education. Mugabe stuck to power as he aged, and he was healthy too. On his 88th birthday, he said, don't drink at all, don't smoke, you must exercise and eat vegetables and fruit. His grip on power got tighter, and his skill at governing got progressively worse. 
So long story short, when he was ousted in 2017 at 93 years old, Zimbabweans, they took to the streets in celebration. Compare that to Winston Churchill's second stint as prime minister, well past his prime. Churchill, who smoked 10 cigars a day and downed a healthy regimen of champagne, cognac, and whiskey, was 77 when he took office in 1951. Churchill's frailty led King George VI to consider asking him to resign, but King George died in 1952, and Churchill's heir apparent, Anthony Eden, fell ill. The visibly declining Churchill got a second wind and took more responsibilities, among them mentoring the young Queen Elizabeth II, a job only he was suited for. He left office in 1955 and spent the next 10 years mostly painting, socializing, and writing, but remained a member of parliament until 1964, shortly before his death. As for his mentee, Queen Elizabeth, she stuck around until age 96, setting the record as the second oldest serving head of state. That's it for What's America Thinking. I'm Julia Manchester. Come back next week and be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hills YouTube channel.